it's Joe West from the West Barn. And Mike Shimshek. Our podcast where we talk about all things creative, entrepreneurialism for the creators. And um, today we're lucky to have a, a legislator in with us. So, you know, everything that we get to do on a daily and yearly basis revolves around the money we make and uh, who represents us. And as songwriters, sometimes we feel underrepresented. Uh, but we're glad to have the senator from the, the great state of Tennessee, Marsha Blackburn, here. Thank you for coming. And I'm delighted to be here with you and to talk about all things creative. I think one of the unique spots for Nashville is this great creative community. And not only do we see it in songwriting and in film, but we see it uh, also with our works of art. And I think it spills over into some of the other industrial sectors. You've got auto designers that are here that are doing next generation automobiles uh you see it in healthcare delivery systems and finding ways to innovate so good things happen with a creative community it's interesting that you bring that up um you're probably the representative well going back in time a little bit you were the congresswoman for a district in the state of tennessee a state senator this last uh, term, you uh, were elected to the federal Senate, right? Right. right. So now you represent the whole state of Tennessee. But before, you were specifically kind of yeah. our region. You know, I, um, I served as the commissioner for film, entertainment, and music in the state. And I did that in the mid-90s and really walked our state from the analog to digital transition. Um, and... We put our focus at that point in time as we were going from analog to digital. I said, the question we should ask is not how do we serve as a location for a film or a TV show or a music video. How do we become the destination, the place that people want to come? And as we were retooling the industry to go from analog to digital, And, of course, the private sector does all of that. It's government's job to create the right type environment. So I assembled a task force of industry leaders, entertainment, and interactive technology leaders. And we said, how do we do this? And we've put the focus focus on recruiting the infrastructure side of that, some more sound stages, um, post-edit suites, post-production edit suites. Um, JTV came to Tennessee. You had Home Shopping Network that came to Tennessee. You had the Scripps Networks that came to Tennessee. We looked at how you use a digital technology to turn venues into things that can be used for production. So it was a change of thought in how you approached what you were going to build and create. It's interesting to see everybody fleeing California. It's mm-hmm. like, why would not? Why would they not make that content in Los Angeles? Everybody they need is there. They've been driven out. And I think it's cool that the state will provide an environment where people can actually come in here to make those movies because it brings so much income into the area. Um, well, you- it does. And, you know, you build out the infrastructure. But, Joe, and you know this so well because you've put a good bit of emphasis on this. A big part of that infrastructure is the human capital yeah. and the workforce that is needed. And we are so fortunate. Giving people a shot to That's earn right. a living. That's exactly Don't right. drive the business out of town. That's right. You're, you're in a unique spot that it's like mu- right now on the planet, Nashville is probably the biggest music city on the entire planet. People that I have business relationships with regarding products all across the globe, they say that their entire focus is on Nashville. They consider it to be the epicenter of, of all music happening. So, yeah. you know, I and I know that you were a big part of the, of the Music Modernization Act, right. which is something we want to talk. Today, we're really hoping to get in like, okay, what can we do? What does it look like to be a songwriter in this town? How can we allow people to do that again next year. You know, they talk about, NSAI says that we've lost 90% of our, so we have, we, in essence, we've lost 90% of our paid songwriters. And 
the consequence of that is that we're now in this world that's so small, this last 10%, this little, when you drain the pond, you have those little, all the catfish sort of hanging out in that little bit of water that's left, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there's almost not enough to make a splash to tell the story that we have been dwindled down so far. And I'm wondering, uh, talk to us a little bit about the music monetization app and what that does to help us, right? And and I, I have some things that I want to talk to you about that, but what what can we do as an un since we're not allowed to unionize as an un, unrecognized small minority without special special interest money how do we get it to the point where we can have people creating in nashville and being able to do what they started out to do give them right, the ability to be creators to yeah right we want them to be have the opportunity to be career songwriters and studio musicians and not have it as something that is an accidental or a hobby or an avocation this needs to be their vocation because they love it and that's what they want to do and um, when i went to congress i started the songwriters caucus to provide a forum where creators could talk about the importance of intellectual property protections to them. And then I was able, one of the first things that I did um, was to change the tax code so that when songwriters sell their catalog, they are not paying ordinary income tax. It's a capital They're gains. They're going to pay cap gains. Yeah. That's right, because that saves them a lot of money. This is their small business. This is their catalog of creative you, works. And to get that changed was a huge step. Do you remember, there, this is before my time in town, but they used to let you do something called income averaging. Do you remember this? Yeah. And I might not be calling it the right thing, but like if, if we're if we were lucky enough to have a hit, like one you of my could first run hits, it out over three years or five years, or, right? Yeah. So that it wasn't like we are not tax accountants or lawyers. We're not going to be doing this the same amount of money. But every every blue moon will have a hit, and let's say we got a hundred and fifty grand that year, or two hundred grand if we were lucky. Like, mm -hmm. let's not treat this person like they are a star sh shortstop. You know, this right. is treats. Let's let them spread that income over five to ten years and and pay a, a rate that's commensurate, you know, because some of the money that I paid in tax on some of my hits, it really made me, it it made me afraid because I thought to myself, if I live frugally, I could, I could raise my family for the year on that money. Mm -hmm. Like if I lived really tight to the bone, what I just paid in income tax, mm -hmm. I could actually support my family. So I was fearful every time I would have a hit because you just get busted with that. So I'm wondering, is that something that is in the future for us as creators and songwriters? Right. And this was one of the reasons for moving it to cap gains, because that is such a saver. That is money in your pocket that you're not turning over to the federal government because it doesn't boot your rate up. Yeah. And it allows you to have that cap gains treatment. And we felt like that was an important thing to do. That change, the minute it went into law, changed the way a lot of songwriters work and the kind of money they were, or it enabled them to sell a portion of their catalog if they wanted to sell those rights and then to benefit uh, at, at an advantageous um, structure. So that was an important component. Another thing that helped to make a difference was the Small Business Administration, getting them to open up to, um, to making loans to entertainment industry entities, which they had not done. The first loan that was made um, from them to an entertainment industry was uh, here in Nashville for a company that did a lot of post-production work that needed a digital edit suite. And these are the kind of things that make it easier to do business. And then you get to things like the Songwriters Equity Act and the Music Modernization Act that are fair treatment for those that are creating these works to be able to paid in an, be paid in an equitable manner for streaming and things of that nature and music modernization or uh, everything in DC has an acronym. So yeah. MMA is the acronym for it. That is uh, something that we worked on in a bipartisan manner for years. 
in order to get that to the point that you had that equity within the distribution systems. And the way I kind of simplified that for my colleagues as we worked on this was to say, look, let's focus on end use. Let's not talk about the delivery system because, you know, they're, they were going to have one rate for uh, radio and one rate for satellite and one rate for streaming. And, you know, it's all of these different treatments depending on the technology. What we should be doing is looking at end use. Is this for your listening pleasure? Is it capture and hold? Is it something for... Um, that you're going to use for commercialization. Uh, it's This is the way we need to change how people think about how they use music. Why do you think it's been so long? Like, up until this act, we were acting under legislation from 1909 and from the First World War. In the 30s, yeah. So why, why do you think it's taken so long for us to get sort of viewed through a different lens than other interests? I, I assume it's special interest, right? Because we don't seem to have a lot of backing. That's my pers- perception from the creator's chair. But it's why do you think it takes so long to get, uh, to be able to create an environment where you're actually commensurately paid Because you don't with the have, work? I, I think, one of the reasons it is taken longer is because legislators are going to act more quickly on things they understand. And they do not have as deep an understanding of what you do and uh, I say that many times I felt as if it suffered from the sing for your supper type mentality, you know, that you weren't putting out any money uh, in order to stand up and sing. Like people who that's, create. That's very interesting. <laughs> create I've been in business a for widget. 30 years. I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. And like people that create a widget that give you a thing. And when we talk about intellectual property and intellectual property protections and the importance of that, this this is one of the things I think has has made a difference. Is um, And it's where uh, many of the things that are traveling over the internet and the worth of some of these um, businesses that are based utilizing spectrum and utilizing airwaves and uh, the internet, it has helped us because people value that access and that communications ability more than they value the hardware. And see, in times past, people would value the thing and the hardware more. And it just... Even if you just had a piece of vinyl in your hands, it felt like you had acquired something. You had a thing. That's and then right. we've kind of demystified that or, or detangibilized it, right? It's now this thing that just right. lives on and your phone. And then people say, well, it doesn't cost you. You're not having to buy it. It's just right. out there. It's it's in the air. You can pull it down. Uh, it's It doesn't cost anything. But see, what it cost is the time and talent and ability that it takes to create it. The infrastructure, too, because for anybody to finally... You get yourself into such a ditch in this business that your first hit usually gets you out of the the ditch you've made, right? But it's like, that's an incubator. You get to become great, you know, through all that. And we don't have that. And thank God we still have amazing albums coming out. Like Billie Eilish does this thing with a brother. And, you know, there's a whole new cast of characters coming out. Which is pretty incredible. (laughs) Really incredible. But, you know, there's something, we're losing a legacy of people that came here and woodshedded and were able to woodshed for the three four, five years before they really got it and then started to be great at it. And then the next thing, you know, the Alan Shamblins of the world, right? They mm-hmm. they emerge and they write a song like, I can't make you love me if you don't, or uh, The House That Built Me, you know, Mike Reed and Alan and all those guys that I look up to. It's like, they wouldn't have been able to get to that point if they didn't have the infrastructure that we've taken away, which mm-hmm. is like a shame because this is the 90% that we've lost. I'd love to see a way even with the Music Modernization Act, I am grateful for it. Um, but when it's I look at my changer. royalty changes, my royalty right. checks, they still, on music, on writing songs alone, it's still difficult for me to, f- to feed my family. Mm-hmm. And I'm a successful songwriter. Think about, I'm the 1%, 2% of the top. We need to be able to create an environment 
that is not cost negative to the government, right? I'm not for that. I don't think we should subsidize songwriting, but we should find a, provide an environment where people somehow are, the, sh- the streams that people are getting on a Spotify spin is so low compared to what the yeah. record companies make. Yeah. We just need to be able to make a living. Nobody wants to get rich. We all want to get rich, but we're not, this isn't a smash and grab, you know? Yeah. And that's what, that's what I suffer from. Let me from. Reframe, frame this for you. You are not a millennial that says someday I'm going to be a YouTube star and I'm going to be very rich and it's going to happen by the time I'm 30. <laughs> so, yeah. right, you're in it for the long call. Right. <laughs> so, we, you know, as most yeah. musicians, we don't, we don't have a choice. We're going to continually... Right. It's what we're supposed to do. You yeah. know, and if, yeah. if I, I don't even want help, if I were just making the money from the intellectual property that's been stolen from me, I would have been set up for life already. You know, so it's trying, you know, I know that, and I'm grateful to have folks like you that's, that represent the creative community of Nashville. That's why, you know, you, what I might not have put a finer point on is that, that you as a representative from Tennessee, is pr- it's probably the largest concentration of creators in the world yeah I, at a high I, level i so. loved when i was in the house and representing tennessee's seventh district i would tell people all the time i represent the largest population of songwriters on the face of the earth yeah. let me tell you about this great creative community and i have a good friend who moved here from another state and uh is a writer and then also a songwriter and one day I said, why did you choose to come to Nashville and instead of going to L.A.? And uh, the response to me was, I came here because Nashville is a great place to fail. You know, there's no such thing as a fail test. And you learn something. But the response was, in Nashville, you sit down, you write a song, it doesn't work, you laugh about it, you say, I'm going to shelve it until I can come back to it and rework it. And you might do that, and it might be a number one. But the next day, you take out the paper, and you write another one. And you put together a, a career writing, That's what we need. songwriting. And uh, I, I said, this is just so interesting to me. I said, so basically you came here because it's a level playing field for opportunity. They said, yeah, pretty much. You know, nobody is going to come down on you if you write a song and it doesn't work. Nobody's going to come down on you. Yeah, if- I would argue that it's that war of attrition that's necessary. That's the incubator that that's we right. need to be able to, all Absolutely. those failures at are, are your first success as a result of all those failures. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that is the point of this. And Nashville's a great town uh, for that. And, you know, I kind of came to all of this issue because I was a uh, piano student, you know, played the piano and the organ and the guitar and the ukulele, actually taught ukulele lessons. It was one of my jobs when I've I was a I've got a ukulele teenager. here. I'll pull it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't <yeah>. make me. <laughs> I do somewhere right here. A baritone uke. <laughs> you got it. And, <clears throat> pardon me, but um, playing the piano for my church and uh, learning all the hymns and looking at who wrote the words and the music to yeah. these hymns and appreciating the impact that that not only had on my life, but on the lives of others. And then when I went to college, I got a minor in classical piano and learning about the great composers. And I just loved it. And I served as chairman of the Symphony Guild for the Nashville Symphony and worked hard to help raise the money for the Symphony Center and served uh, on the board of trust also for Cheekwood and very given to what the arts can do to enrich the lives of children and of individuals and always really appreciated you know francis preston would always say um it all begins with the song life all begins with the song and truly believe that it just influences our lives and our daily life in such a manner and so to me going after all this is a worthy fight and to me correcting these wrongs that make it very difficult 
for individuals to stay in the business long yeah, enough I love that. to get that success. Right. That is where they're going to have that ability to impact the lives of others. So a um, little bit of a pivot. Sure. One thing I wanted to, to get your insight on. Uh, politically, there is so much divisiveness in the conversation. I tell people, I remember with the hanging Chad in Florida that people that didn't vote in that election wanted to punch each other in the face mm-hmm. after that. It sort of turned into reality TV after that, right? We sort of just exploded into the social construct, right? And now we're in this period, and and I watched the Taylor Swift documentary, which we were a big part of, probably inadvertently, right? And And I look at those dialogues where people are coming up in an idea, a war of ideas, and you have, and me and Mike probably feel differently on this. Uh, I don't like it when people put a period at the end of a sentence. We'll say, and not that you were called this, but they'll, in political discussions, they'll call somebody, you're a racist. You're, you're like Hitler. You know, and for me, it diminishes the true value of those words. You know, and it's like, we can't have a debate where we talk with one another and actually have the shot at changing somebody's mind with a, with an, a war of good ideas, we end up sort of resorting to this last resort of just name calling and then sort of people more affirmed in their own beliefs when they leave that conversation. How do you feel about that? And what is it like to be a senator at the highest level of government and have to deal with a population that is impossible to please? Well, it takes a lot of patience. I'm a big believer in the First Amendment. And there are times that I've been somewhere and somebody has walked right up in front of me and just started blasting me. And I will tell them, I will say, you know, I don't agree with what you're saying, but here's, let me tell you just a couple of things. First of all, I believe in free speech. So I will fight to the death to defend your ability to say such things to me even though I think they're inappropriate. And then if there's still an open door, uh, I will tell them that our nation has benefited mightily and freedom and freedom's cause has benefited mightily by a tried and true tradition in this country, which is respectful, robust political debate. How do we get back to that? Because I don't feel like we have that. You know, <laughs> and that's and that's the thing. I encourage them to do that. And I try to make certain that my actions encourage that. And, you know, when I point out to someone something that they have said or done using their own words, you know, that's one thing. Uh, but some of this... You know, you're going to have that type of vitriol, and I wish that we had more of the the bipartisanship. I was honored in uh, 2018 for by the Ripon 2017 by the Ripon Society with their uh, award for bipartisan accomplishment. And getting things done in a bipartisan manner. So to me, I always prefer to work in a bipartisan manner. I do think that with the advent of social media and people able to hide behind a moniker, they feel emboldened to use this moniker or their avatar, if you will, and to just say very vicious things, things they would like to say, but their filter comes off and they will just have at you. I feel like that the more I can work in a bipartisan manner and help to open those doors, I'm going to do it right now. I am working in a bipartisan way on some bills, um, for internet broadband expansion that's an area that i've really led in with um closing that digital divide tammy baldwin who is out of uh out of wisconsin she and i have a bill dealing with internet exchanges which are these data centers and grants to put these into underserved areas and unserved areas uh diane feinstein 
is the co-chairman to my leadership on the technology task force and Senator Feinstein and I are working together really well. Senator Blumenthal and Senator Klobuchar and I have been in behind all of these big tech apps for uh, the way they are allowing pedophiles and predators to use these to track our children. And um, I'm working with Senator Tester and Senator Manchin on some things to increase health care for our veterans. And um, we are working with a group of uh, Democratic senators and also one of my colleagues from when I was in the House, Anna Eshoo, who's a congresswoman from Northern California. And about uh, 10 days, two weeks ago, she and I started working on, we were looking at what was happening with most of our essential pharmaceutical ingredients being manufactured in China. And we said, you know what, this is a problem. And if we continue to have a coronavirus issue similar to what SARS is, you know, that we need to be bringing those back. So we started back then. Uh, you know, which seems like a lifetime ago now with where the coronavirus is now. And we have been picking up individuals that want to work with us to bring this manufacturing I guess back there's a pl- yeah. I guess there's a ton of issues that are like, well, who would be opposed to it? I'm sure that I'd be surprised, you know. But like yeah. when somebody calls your heart, your motivation of your heart into it, like when somebody, if someone were to, I'm sure people, you just must have a really great, self-centered image i i think it's just being principled and you know with the how things do you, with Taylor, how do you resolve that like, well, like whenever you're hurt you know, by something I i'm sure a name calling or someone's ideal right. of who you right. are you're human you know. yeah and and you are and you know your your kids see it and your friends see it and you just go oh my goodness uh, but i know that those were things that were being said by my opponent Right. In the Senate race. And I know that someone must have given her this information on a sheet of paper and said, this is who this person is. And she took that, um, probably, and thought that that was accurate and, you know, didn't look at the votes, uh, didn't look at a record. Right. And that's what that's my problem know. with those issues. It's like somebody who takes... Um, a narrow-minded approach to just a little bit of data. When I was in college, I took humanities course. We were studying all the old philosophers, and they were talking about how it is, how do you know what is truth? Mm-hmm. What is reality, right? What is actual truth? How do any of us know? Well, truth is different to every person. Well, no, there's a, that is true. But there are some situations that are finite. There are, yes, there are. Right? And there is the truth. And, and we have to rely on television and radio and internet and and sift through it and that's why i think so many people now are not watching mainstream media or cable news they go to podcasts and websites it's a drag to to not really be able to tell your son like i don't know if that's true or not right right you have to go research it and who has the time to be an expert on any of that stuff we rely on so many other people to tell us what is truth you know in the in people yeah it is i'm I'm as liberal as they come, and I can barely watch. I'm not the like MSNBC. Some of it's just like, all right, this is just so I think biased that there's in a, that direction. Yeah, I think that, there's an opinion journalism right. that comes into play in that, and you know, I I just look at it. Taylor Swift is an incredibly talented young woman, and I am so grateful that she feels like Nashville should be her creative center. I think that is good. For every creator that is here. Now, was she given information about me that was not accurate? Yes. Has she called me, sat down, said, can you talk to me about this? No. Would I? Of course. I visit with people every single week who are not in agreement with me that say, I want a fuller explanation of this. And as I said, we are always willing to talk with individuals who are looking for that respectful robust discussion do you feel like you could be swayed on an issue do you feel like like you have at this stage of your life you know how you see the world 
But I'd like to gauge my success as to sit down with somebody that I respect and have the idea that they could change my mind. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think that that's a genuine conversation. Like, I don't necessarily want to even start a conversation where I don't feel like the other person's mind can be changed. You know, Joe, I, um, I'm firm in my principles and my underpinning, but I was speaking to religious broadcasters earlier today, and I had introduced a, a piece of legislation in 2019 toward the end of the year that was um, the Campus Free Speech Act. This is a resolution, and it deals with uh, having these, eliminating these speech codes and speech zones and those type things on campuses, because going to college should be a time when you are engaging new ideas and you are expanding your world view, and you're looking at things and saying, do I think this is right or do I think it's wrong? And when you get into these uh, speech codes and speech zones, then instead of expanding, what you are doing is taking students and you're narrowing what they are allowed to explore and discuss. And it's more like putting their thought into a funnel. And I want kids to go to college and experience that robust discussion and learn how to debate. When I was in college, uh, we would sit in the student union and there was a guy that was a, turned out to be a good friend. I still see him from time to time when he comes into DC. And he is still liberal and I am still conservative. And that is not going to change. But we would have the greatest debates. We would feel like we solved the whole world's problems. And it was just such great fun. And through the years as he's come into D.C. and he is still at Mississippi State University where I went to school and he would bring students in for the Stennis Foundation and I served on that board. And we would talk to them about how I would say he was my worthy sparring partner. and But we had a respect for one another and for the fact that I was going to be sufficiently grounded as a conservative. He was going to be sufficiently right. grounded as a liberal. Now, That's what we need. Where, How do we get I don't think we, I don't think we have we, that. Where could we find consensus on an issue? Right. And... That is what needs to be role modeled for kids in college. Wouldn't it be great if they went into a humanities class and you had regularly into that class a professor who came from a conservative view? Yeah, I feel like we've lost a bit of civility. Um, that there is like a Venn diagram. There's overlapping things. There's some things you might you guys might believe in the, that I'm like, okay, I can, I can get behind that. I understand that, you know, like yeah, when I'm talking so, about it's like, I creative like artist it's rights, so, yeah. you agree with that. You know, the work that I've done to push yeah. intellectual property protections into trade agreements, yeah. that is huge for Nashville. Yeah. That is not a partisan issue. And you look at the tier one for China and the IP protections we got there, USMCA. Yeah, that's the a big IP, deal. It is a really big deal. And I'm telling you, I have worked so hard to make that happen. I worked so hard to educate people and get the tax law change. You know, I spent, what, eight years trying to work with colleagues to get the MMA ready to go. Jerry Nadler and I right now are working on the AMFM. Act. I talked to somebody from the academy about that this week because that deals with the broadcasters and getting that money for performers over radio broadcast, terrestrial broadcast. See, we've still got to fix that. And then, you know, let's get these things done. And then when is going to be the time that we can, in a bipartisan manner, say, hey, should we look at normalizing these rates so you're not having to figure out what's what? I think at the end of the day, if you believe that somebody has your best interests in mind, that you yeah. can trust them, that, they're, that their motives are good, that goes a long way with me. Like even when, when me and my wife argue, I try to make sure that 
I'm trying to hear what it is she's saying to me. And I want her to be happy. I'm not trying to win an argument with her. And I feel like if we had a little bit more faith in the other side, like I know Mike, and we may not line up politically or on the same exact lines, but I know Mike, I would vouch for him 100% of the time. So I can almost see the world through his eyes a little bit, right? I think that's maybe yeah. what we need to do. And there's the problem is we've got, we've got people coming in from the outside that are interjecting these, it's almost like villain-esque to manipulate and to, div- to devise people against each other. Yeah. You know, with misinformation, yeah. with right. with half true titles. Yeah, I know. I, I don't read my Facebook. I don't read my Twitter. <laughs> You've got to be an amazingly I, strong person. I like I'm, a, I'm I hate it when people talk about me on the internet. You yeah. know, like with my songs being played. You know, it's yeah. like I can't take that. So right. Well, and I had a friend, uh, a good friend, who is a Democrat. She called a couple of Sundays ago, and she said, "Hey, uh, she and her husband wanted to come over and." clean up all of my social media she said we'll show you how to do this i said i i am an elected official i can't take things off my social media <laughs> you, you, i guess you said, can't right no i can't and she said oh this is horrible and these are people that are in my party <laughs> and she said, i want them to do stop. you read the comments on the internet <laughs> no you don't no, you just don't even do, you just do. you have to i mean the, yeah you, uh, here's what i want to ask you this sure I don't know if you watch House of Cards or Veep or any of these political shows that are on. I saw House of Cards when it first started. How, I is that, seen it. Is in. that completely the way it is or completely the way it isn't? No. <laughs> no. In my mind, I'm like, wow. Who's dying really? to ask? <laughs> not, in, not in my world. I'll say it like that. It's not uh, that divisive? Uh, no. I, I think that there are some people who are... Um, their idea of engagement would not be to work across the aisle. I think there are some of those individuals and I think they're missing a wonderful opportunity. I always say, look, I'm willing to have a conversation with anybody that wants to make the lives of Tennesseans better. I am an all comers on that. Do you make your decisions like, do you literally say, oh, this is my constituency. 51% of them think this. I will vote that way. Or do you sort of take it as a advisement in your decisions? You know, I, I'm one of these, I like to read the bills. I like to read the bill summaries. Um, I I go back, I do a good bit of due diligence. I do a lot of reading. So usually when we have a an issue that's going to receive some form of legislative change, there will have been some discussion in the public arena. And I like to go back and uh, pull some of that and read it, and it helps to inform my decision. So um, I'm not much for sleeping, so I read late in the night and early in the morning and do my best to say, okay, every day I like to do, I like to be sure I'm preserving five things, faith, family, freedom, hope, and opportunity. So the votes that I cast, what is that going to do to freedom, free people, free markets. That's interesting. How is it going to affect uh, the family unit if it is something about a family? How is it going to protect religious liberty, which is a founding principle for this nation? What is it going to do to provide hope for a better day or for an individual to have that hope? And what will it do if it's Opportunity Will it open doors or shut doors? Will it throw up barriers or will it remove barriers? I think that's great. I mean, that. And I have a mission statement I live my life by, and it's like half, the, half of the trick is just knowing, having a plan to be able to parse your decisions by. Right. So, like, when you say that to me, I think, man, that's, that's a really sound and rational way to look at the world. I, I could go to bed at night and feel pretty good about my decisions. If, as long as I had gone through, filtered them through that, Right. through that net so well we appreciate you coming yeah. on did you want have, there's yeah there's one thing i wanted to ask you about you know sure. obviously coming from a group of musicians <laughs> is um what your no your stance on marijuana that was the question that was given to <laughs> the, me the music yeah. <laughs> out of all of our friends that's what they fed that's to that's you that's what they fed to the me <laughs> so i'm just i'm working for the people <laughs> yeah he's a man of the people oh man of the people so i'm just curious i i had read that you had um you were open to the idea at least of medical marijuana in tennessee is that I, accurate? 
this is about, I guess it was three years or so ago, um, I had encouraged us. I was on Energy and Commerce and Chairman of Comms and Tech, and um, we were having a meeting looking at health issues. We'd been working through 21st Century Cures, which was a huge, wonderful, bipartisan effort. Um Democrats, Republicans, House, and Senate to fund research and look for cures for certain um, abnormalities and diseases and things. And after we came past and through our work on that, I said medical cannabis is something that the states are beginning to take up. And Colorado at that point was looking at recreational marijuana and I said you know if we don't want a hodgepodge of different state laws then and we should have learned a lesson in prohibition and some of this what we should do is have the FDA grant a reclassification for cannabis for the purposes of NIH directed and controlled research to see if there is a quantifiable uh, medicinal property. To me, that makes sense. That's what any other drug is going to go through. And a lot of our um, veterans who experience tremendous pain, uh, legs or arms or things, this is something that many times they would mention to me. And I said, why don't we do this? And uh, I didn't win that debate. I felt like it was the right thing to do. I still think it's the right thing to do. And Mike, I think until we do it and we settle from a medical perspective, the properties of cannabis as it relates to medicine and pain relief and healing, I think we're going to continue to have that debate and states are going to take uh, take much of this into their own hands and now we see a lot of the CBD lotions and oils and I have people that say this has helped me more than anything else yeah. I talk to them all the time well no it's a it's an do orderly you process it, do you see way. it as a recreational Tennessee passing recreational law? I don't in talking to law enforcement okay. uh, they will tell you driving under the influence issues no they don't and I am not in favor of that I do think it is appropriate to do the research to make the determination on cannabis for uh, medical use. And we would be well served to settle that with the NIH and the FDA in charge. How would that work? Like, let's say the, let's say the federal government doesn't have an issue with it and they, from a federal level, they legalize it. Would the states have to follow or could the states have different rules in regards you to know, I, I can't give you an ironclad on that. I, yeah. What I would know, if they did the research and the NIH made a determination and came back to the FDA with that, that then there would be legislation that would handle a rescheduling. And right. um, then past that, um, I usually with pharmaceuticals, there is that federal preemption. But I can't speak directly to what would happen there. Well, we want to thank you for coming on and hanging out I with us. I am just been absolutely delighted honest, to be here in the barn. And genuine. <laughs> you know, no one came to me prior to this and said things were off the table, which you, I would fully respect and appreciate. So we appreciate you being completely open sure. and honest and just sitting down and being genuine. That's, um, that's something to really be um, admired, you know, to, to be fearless like that and um we thank you so much for coming in hopefully we'll get down the road here and have some more musical questions and dialogue about you know your constituents that are in the yeah, creative you fields know, stay and have in you back touch on with me because uh we are trying to find a vehicle to move the amfm act and i know that the recording academy and some of the groups that are going to be coming into nashville and of course our friend bart herbison does such a fantastic a job, job with nsai and uh they're all going to be up and and 
we'll be talking to them about what we need to do. Well, everybody that I know in your camp, uh, John Clement and Jay Strabino, who I both know both those guys personally, have nothing but really great things to say about you. And I think that that's the tale of the tape there. Whenever people that are around a powerful person have uh, actually really good, candid things to say about them. So, well, I appreciate that. They're good you. people, uh, and you, we've got a good team. Do you have um, a website? I'm sure. I do. Uh, Blackburn.senate.gov. Okay. And people can go there. I do actually do a uh, newsletter that goes out every Friday afternoon and we cover everything that's been going on in DC uh, Facebook Twitter you're going to find me there we are regularly uh, posting things on social media we do some Instagram stories so that people can keep up with what is going on in Washington and we want to be able to help people cut through fact and fiction yeah. and uh, get to the heart of the issue. And so we are very aggressive in putting those things up and hope that people will sign up for our newsletter. When We, we do a lot of telephone town halls. Uh, we live stream these on Facebook. It's been so interesting. People say, I don't have time to go to a town hall anymore because they're, you know, like at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday or something. So they love when we do them. Uh, over telephone and they can punch start th- star three and get in the queue and ask a question and the whole time they're driving home from work or you know they're cooking dinner and so we always do these in the evenings well great thank you for being on if there's any top thank secret you. stuff you'd like to tell us now would be the time <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm Joe West. You can meet me. You can see me at uh, joe-west.com and of course the school is apprenticeacademy.net. I'm Mike Shimshack. I still don't have a website. I'm at Shaq Jones, S-H-A-C-K-J-O-N-Z on Instagram. There you go. Well, thank you all. And until the next time, this is from the West Bard signing off.